Yeah, well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to talk about my favorite topic. Um, they always say that uh, the, the, the best salesman is one who believes in his product. And I hope, I hope, I hope my enthusiasm will come across. Okay, so here we have our first slide. We see a little sketch of Fermi on orbit with a large area telescope perched on top of it and a sketch of gamma rays. And so here's what I'm gonna talk about first, of course, um, a quick review of pulsars, their essentials for um, those of you who don't think about these every day. And then I'm gonna tell sort of the history of gamma ray pulsars uh, starting in the early 90s, personal history, and then um, just sort of telling the story of how things went for us with Fermilab. So I'll be talking about me, but don't, don't think that badly. Okay, and then, and then the main point is, is that um, detecting gamma ray pulsations is really, really easy once you've put all the tools in place. And the tools are simply that your clock times have to be good. You have to have an accurate model of the spin down evolution of your neutron star. And you need to make sure that all your code is good. And at that point, um, in addition to all the various cuts you're used to, to bring out your gammas relative to some sort of broad background, you have this timing signature, which gives you an extra boost of sensitivity and a very unambiguous signature. So it's, it's very gratifying when you see it because it's just crystal clear. You know that you're seeing what you think you're seeing and not something else. All right. And then um, I'll be giving friendly advice to CTA and I'm going to be drawing the contrast between what was our situation before launch and what's your situation before you come up to, to full, full power. All right. So. First statement, I have to make it, is a pulsar is a rotating neutron star. Uh, we'll talk about more of this in a moment, but it's got these beams. And when the beam sweeps your line of sight, you see a flash, like for a lighthouse, like for the, the light on top of a police car. That's, that's most of what you need to know about pulsars. So neutron stars are very cool. It's the um, densest that normal matter gets. Um, any, any more gravitational pressure and it will collapse into a black hole. And they only exist in a fairly narrow range of masses. They go from a little under 1.4 solar masses to getting towards three solar masses. It's an open question how, how heavy are the heaviest neutron stars. Um, they spin incredibly fast. They have a huge moment of inertia, and so their rotation is incredibly stable. And uh, they've inherited a magnetic field from the massive star from which they were born. And this magnetic field is now concentrated into a very small volume and so is ridiculously strong. Uh, small volume says 13 kilometer radius, so it's smaller than a large city. And um, we all know that if you have something magnetic that's spinning, we call it a dynamo. It makes electricity, and electricity accelerates particles. And then these particles in the presence of a magnetic field or other matter will radiate. And so there you've got it. Uh, they're the endpoint of solar evolution, stellar evolution, excuse me. So in, in this drawing I have here, maybe you can see my mouse moving, clouds of dust collapse to make stars, and then whether it's a star of a few solar masses or less, or several solar masses or more, everything is different. In the top branch, it's a very slow process. You have stars like our sun. After billions of years, they'll give you a planetary nebula, and they'll wind up as a white dwarf, a white dwarf, which is atoms uh, compressed by gravity to roughly the size of the Earth. The lower branch, is a little sexier, it's a lot more fun. Um, more mass, more gravitational compression, hotter, denser, access to more uh, thermonuclear reactions. So it burns more, burns faster, it burns hotter. And the lifetimes are not billions of years, but are millions of years. And when it's over, it runs out of gas, 
and explodes in a violent supernova, the core of the star, depending on this mass, will leave you a neutron star or a black hole. Everybody here knows the crab, seen um, with the naked eye, uh, even in daytime, in July of 2054. And then probably everybody here is sort of ecological, likes recycling, and so you'll like the fact that all this stardust that gets blown out into the interstellar medium then contributes to the next generation of stars. And all these heavy elements that you've made in the lifetime of heavy stars accumulates and contributes to the world as we know it. So, so it's all very cool stuff. And then um, how many pulsars are there in the Milky Way? How many pulsars are there in the universe? How many, how many neutron stars are there? Well, just a rule of thumb is that if you have one supernova per century and your galaxy has been around for 10 to the 10 years, well, that gives you of order 10 to the eight neutron stars. Um, so neutron stars have been predicted in the 1930s and then mostly forgotten. By coincidence, there was this Italian fellow in the 60s who did some theoretical calculations of what I said, a, a, rotating, a rotating magnet making a dynamo, making beams of stuff. And at the same time, there were radio astronomers who were uh, looking for transient, transient radio signals. They were looking for interstellar scintillation in order to discover quasars. And this is really important because when you have noisy electronics, what you do is you integrate in time. And what that means is you get a big resistance times capacitance, RC, so that you can wash things out. But if you wanna see quicker signals, then you need to beat down the noise in your system. And then you can shrink your RC time constants. And they did this. And in addition to the scintillation and discovering lots of quasars, uh, Jocelyn Bell, pictured on the left, she saw something she called scruff, weird little signals on the, on the strip chart recorders that she couldn't, couldn't really identify. And so she pursued it and talked her boss into doing a Zoom. And when they did the Zoom, you got the kind of thing like you see there, which was individual pulses. Very exciting. So here we are, we today know about uh, 33, 3,400 pulsars, and it's very convenient to represent them on what we call the PP dot diagram. P is the x-axis, that's the spin period. P dot is the rate of change of the spin period, and it's on a log-log scale. And you clearly see two populations of pulsars, what we call normal pulsars, or young or middle-aged, and then off to the left here, recycled and millisecond pulsars. Uh, this green dot up here at top left is the crab, born about a thousand years ago. And you can see that it's right on this blue dashed line that we call the characteristic age. And this will make sense to you. If you see something that's spinning and you measure its rate of spin down, well, you can extrapolate backwards and figure out when it started more or less. And it's an approximation, but it, it works okay. So pulsars are born up here at top left. They have um, their moment of inertia times their spin rate times the rate at which they're losing rotational energy. We call the spin down power. It's written down here, E dot is equal to four pi squared times I times the spin frequency times the first derivative spin frequency or P dot over P cubed. And um, we see that it ranges from 10 to the 38 down to 10 to the 30 ergs per, per second. So they spin, they radiate, they lose power. Since they lose power, they spin less quickly. And since they spin less quickly, they radiate less. So it's a sort of vicious circle. The, 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 the more they slow down, the less they radiate but they're still radiating, so they slow down more, and so forth and so on. And so in the course of a pulsar's lifetime, it will evolve across the field and eventually get to this black line, which is an approximation of what we call the radio death line. At this point, it's spinning so slowly, we're at periods of a few to several seconds here, and with a magnetic field that perhaps is weakened, so that the dynamo is not working 
well enough anymore to make radio emission. We call that the radio death line, I said that. And, and so these uh, 100 million neutron stars in the galaxy, well, a lot of them are here beyond the death line, but they don't pulse, they don't radiate, we don't see them, they're dead. We call that the graveyard or cemetery. Um, now I drew some lines here with different, uh, I got one's curving, I got one's going straight, they have different slopes. Um, that's because we don't know exactly what the braking mechanism is to slow down the star. If it's purely dipole radiation, then there's something called the braking index. I'll talk about that in a minute, which is three, and you get a diagonal more or less like the one I did there. But what if the magnetic field decreases? It'll curve. What if the magnetic field increases? It'll curve the other way. And the other thing we see is that in order the um, I didn't say it, but all the colored dots are pulsars we've seen in gamma rays. The green ones are ones that we found the way that CTA will find pulsars. That is to say, somebody already knows about the pulsar, gives you a rotation ephemeris, and you fold your data and you see the pulsations. The blue ones uh, is something that's been very successful for Fermi Lab. We find a static DC gamma ray source on the sky and wonder, Maybe it's a pulsar, and then we do a pulsation search. Um, we will all be extremely pleasantly surprised if CTA can do this someday, and I won't talk about it more today. And then over here, the red ones, millisecond pulsars. So what you notice, and then the black ones, the black ones are ones where we in Fermi, we have a rotation ephemeris. We've folded the data to look for pulsations, and we haven't seen any. And I'll, I'll go into this in more detail. And then the gray dots, the gray dots are known pulsars where we don't have a rotation ephemeris, and so we never have folded it. My personal ambition is to fold all pulsars someday, so I'm trying to track down rotation ephemerides for the gray ones. I'm about halfway there, I'm about halfway there. Okay, now let's look at the left-hand side of the slide, and there's a little sketch that says what I said a minute ago, um, the spin frequency rate decreases as the years go by, and the rate of decrease decreases as the rate decreases. Want me to say that again? I'm not gonna. Okay, so I said down here, the slow down P dot slows down. We call that P double dot. Now, if you have a perfect magnetic dipole and no timing noise, you get a parabola. Even if it's not a magnetic dipole, if it's some other mechanism slowing down your neutron star, you'll get a parabola with a different curvature. In real life, we measure the parabola for a dozen or so pulsars, maybe 20. It's difficult to measure the second derivative um, because of something called spin down jitter or timing noise. And that is, I said that uh, this, this, this neutron star with this huge inertia and this huge amount of en rotational energy, it spins down mostly very regularly, but things are going on, especially in the young pulsars. You've got a pulsar wind carrying away energy and it's turbulent and there's feedback with the star that applies torques in a sporadic chaotic way. You can have micro star quakes, the, the, the crust of the neutron star settling in and cooling off. And, and that too can lead to um, turbulent, chaotic micro changes in the moment of inertia. And all this means that instead of following the black line and having nice, smooth, regular evolution, you can have some, some chaotic movement. There are pulsars for which that timing noise is very, very small. And once you've measured how the slowdown evolves, you can make very accurate predictions for years to come about just when pulses will arrive. These are what we call the good timers, the fantastic natural clocks, millisecond pulsars that people use to search for gravity waves. And I'll only mention them in passing, ask me questions about it later if you like. Right, and off we go. 
So this is just um, about reincarnation, life after death. I, I made you all sad talking about the neutron star graveyard off here to the right. But some of these stars, they'll find a binary companion. The binary companion, when it gets old, it gets fat, and it will give its angular momentum to the dead neutron star and spin it up. And that's how you get the um, little second pulsars. Uh, before Fermi, there were some predictions of gamma rays from millisecond pulsars. There was even a detection uh, of one, one of them with uh, data from Egret on the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. But most people thought it would be anecdotal, marginal, not much. And one of the big surprises with Fermi is that uh, it's turned out to be half. Half of our gamma ray pulsars, roughly, are, are millisecond pulsars. And everything I'm gonna tell you today about um, getting the timing right, accurate timing, um, is it's all more so for millisecond pulsars. Everything has to be that much more careful and precise. Um, so pulsars are mainly a radio phenomenon. 90% uh, of the pulsars that we know about are only known in radio, but the power in radio is peanuts. It's like wisps of smoke. And that's what you see on this plot here. You have the power as a function of the uh, electromagnetic power. And radio way over here is a factor of a million, a million down from the power radiated in gamma rays, which is a thousand times more than the power radiated in X-rays. So the gamma ray pulsars, the available power from the spin down, um, most of it is carried away by the electron wind, but a substantial fraction of it, which can be a 10th of a percent to 50, 60, 70% of the power goes off in gamma rays. And so gamma rays are um, good diagnostic tools for understanding pulsar emission. And then the other thing is very hard spectrum increasing. And at some point just runs out of the, the mechanisms that generate the gamma rays um, just can't go any farther. You're not gonna get any higher energy electrons. The magnetic field is only as strong as it is. And so you get gamma rays up to a few GeV and then the flux goes way down. And CTA, your, your vocation is to study the details of this cut off and also look for additional components. And um, this is almost my last, or I don't remember. Yeah, it's about my last. Um, probably most of you, when you think of a pulsar beam, you think of the radio beam, which is here in pink. It's sort of a conical thing. And, and, and I made that worse because I told you to think about a lighthouse. In the lighthouse, you've got this conical beam going out. Well, gamma ray beams aren't like that. Gamma ray beams look more like the dorsal fin on this fish here. Uh, they're very, very narrow in longitude. They're very sharp in longitude. They're very, very extended in latitude. Um, it goes from the north magnetic pole here on the fish's forehead all the way to the south magnetic pole down towards the fish's bottom. And, and then it's curved. It's curved because all of these magnetic field lines are rotating at speeds near the speed of light. And, and so the lags, uh, effects of relativistic aberrations are consequent and, and therefore you get this, this bent stuff. So this is, this is just something to help you think about it, this fish. But down here, lower left from Alice Harding, you have a model where you see that indeed, um, the most intense emission is around the equator. There is emission all the way up to high latitudes, Finland, uh, Terra del Fuego, uh, but it's much, much less. And then um, two beams following along with a, with a half rotation, a little less than a half rotation between the two beams. And then uh, this banana here, well, the region in the magnetosphere where the electrons are getting accelerated to high energy and then forced to follow these incredibly intense magnetic field lines to then radiate by curvature radiation, that whole region is more or less banana shaped. And depending on the speed of rotation the and the um, inclination of the magnetic field relative to the rotation axis, the banana will be more or less 
curved, more or less fat, more or less compact. But the reason I insist on this is that um, many of you today are in rooms where there's lighting from light bulbs, which are spherical, and there's lighting from long neon tubes. And the geometry of the radiated beam is different. And, and the geometry of the beams from neutron stars, they come from this banana-shaped region. It all is tangential to the curves of the banana, and that's what gives you these incredibly narrow pulses in longitude, which can, however, be quite extended in latitude. And as I said before, the challenge for CTA is to detail as well as possible um, what's happening at the highest energies rated by a pulsar, and in particular, to look for other components, components that we don't see very well with Fermi, such as inverse Compton. And the consequences are important because, um, well, just as an example, uh, you all know that people have been looking for signatures of dark matter, neutral annihilation in the diffuse uh, radiation all these years, and they thought maybe they saw it, and well, it's not at all clear because there is a population of gamma rays and uh, a population of gamma ray pulsars. And so the pulsars, even if you don't care that much about pulsars, you do need to understand their contribution to overall radiation fields for um, understanding galactic ecology. Uh, here we go. Last but not least of the overview, these are the four pulsars seen from the ground that Francesco mentioned. Um, thank you very much, Arash. Arash and I work together a lot on Fermi and um, Hess pulsars, and he's my, my main resource for knowing what's going on in your field. And so here's the PP dot diagram, P dot P. No TV um, camera rays from millisecond pulsars yet. And then up here you have Crab, Vela, Gaminga, and another egret pulsar, all seen rather well in a range of energies. And, and how many should CT expect to see? Well, that's been studied by Arash and his colleague, Rutogwe. And in some slides they sent me, it looks like it's of order a dozen, but a dozen, as I understand it, uh, spread between North and South, CTA South, CTA North. And then also spread sort of evenly in right ascension, which means you'll see some in the winter, some in the summer. So at any given time, any given telescope will not have more than a small handful of pulsars that are observable. That's it for the overview. And now let's see, and I've used half my time. Oof, I've used two thirds of my time. All right, well, off we go. Um, so I used to be a Sharonkov person. I worked for 10 years on atmospheric Sharonkov telescopes, first in La Palma and then in the Pyrenees. And that was the time at which I got familiar with Egret, their catalog, and, and pulsars in particular. And when we were working on Cat and Celeste at Themis in the Pyrenees, um, Celeste's goal was to get as low an energy as any Cherenkov telescope could at the time. We were the lowest. We were quite proud of that. And we had a very messy detection of the crab, which we wrote up in a thesis but never published in a journal. I kind of think we really saw it, but okay, who cares? Never mind. We published it as an upper limit. And I think you all know this plot here at left. This is a compilation after, after Veritas finally did see it in a convincing way at high energy. And so here's our upper limit uh, from Celeste. And what's really, really important when you're looking for a faint signal and, and you're right at the borderline of threshold is you've gotta be 100% sure that your analysis works. And so you need to validate everything as well as possible before looking for your actual money plot. And, and so what we did here and what I encourage you to do is to use your instrument to detect the crab optical pulsar. And we did this and we saw the optical phase diagram and it was a lot of fun and let us to understand a lot of stuff. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. All right, so um, after 10 years of Celeste and Sharon Koff, I decided I was tired of um, full moons and rainy weather and I wanted to go into orbit. And I had the opportunity to join BLAST and I went up to Stanford for a year and we were testing the calorimeter with atmospheric muons. 
And in the meantime, I was studying, you know, what do I want to do? What science do I want to do with blast? And I learned that pulsars um, were going to be just a bonanza with Fermi. And that there was a person who was supposed to be in charge. And that person had gone off to do other things, other, other career opportunities. And the topic was an orphan. And I went to the IAU in Prague and I organized a uh, splinter session about pulsar timing. They all came. Some people were sort of angry. You know, what took you so long? What took you so long? But we got organized and we wrote up um, a paper and we formed something called the Pulsar Timing Consortium. And we resolved that based on what we'd seen from Egret, we were going to try to gamma phase fold all of the high E dot pulsars, which was 240 at the time. Today it's 440. And we launched into at that time Guillemot there. Lucas Guillemot was my student, and he's now a, a radio astronomer, astronomer in, in Nancy. Um, he started the methodical task of testing, testing, testing all of the code. And he wrote something called the Fermi Template 2 plugin at that time. I'll talk more about that later. So here it is. And, and what I want you to take away from, from this slide is just that we've got a Columbia, whoops, mouse. We've got Columbia, we've got Arecibo, we've got Green Bank, we've got Parks, we've got, we've got a few key people from the key radio telescopes on the planet um, who are signing up to help us get this right. Um, so the formal agreement was that they would give us the high E dot ones, but in fact, with goodwill and informally, they ended up also giving us another 800 with all E dots, ones that they just happened to have. And that enabled us to test not only our idea that only high E dot ones emit, but also look for the other ones. And then here in the abstract, we talk about verifying the software and, and testing the accuracy of our whole chain. So beautiful radio telescopes and a memo of understanding. Um, I'll confess that at the beginning, people were a little bit uptight and they wanted things written black and white and you know who, who does what, who shares what. If I share, will people share with me? Um, but that didn't last very long. And um, once we got to work and results started coming in, um, people trusted each other and, and the MOU expired after a year or two. And today we just keep working as if, you know, here we are 14 years later and uh, we just keep going. And in addition to the Pulsar Timing Consortium, there's something called the Pulsar Search Consortium, which is to a large extent, the same people, same instruments, but a different goal the goal is to search for unknown radio pulsars in pulsar-like unidentified gamma ray sources. You can ask me about that later if you like. Another thing I learned when I was at Stanford is that, um, you know, I went around, I said, so, you know, how do we, you know, I'd worked on Celeste, I'd worked on CAT, uh, we had a VM, we had data acquisition, we had GPS, and I, I knew about all that stuff, and I would just, you know, I'd say, well, hey, you know, uh, how does LAT do its timing? And it was really scary because um, everyone would say, gee, that's a really important question. I'm too busy. I don't know. Go ask so-and-so. And so-and-so -so would say the same thing. And I, I, I quickly realized that the whole issue of making sure that the times are right was an orphan. And this was scary. And at the same time, this is really important, um, I learned that every single space mission before GLAST had had a timing goof and never the same one twice. So I, I started to get um, scared. So I thought, and as I said before, you know, I spent my working hours watching muons sailing through the lap. And so I said, well, gee, you know, all we got to do, all we got to do, all we got to do is take a pair of scintillators put them next to the lap in the, in the, on the ground before we launch, and you look at an atmospheric muon go through the lap, and it'll generate a timestamp through the flight software and the really complicated electronics and everything. And we use our simple acquisition system. I, I, I took the VME GPS module from, from Celeste, which previously had been on CAT, and 
you know, it's just easy as pie. And uh, so I put all that in a suitcase and checked my bags and went to Arizona. And, and there we are, we're in the factory of the future, General Dynamics. And we put our little simulators right next to the thing. And you can see here, I'm showing you the little rectangles there. That's, a, um, that's an antenna for GPS receiver. And it's plugged into a little box like this. And there's two of them on board. Everything is redundant in redundancy of the redundant spacecraft, do everything twice. And that's why you also have two on each side. In case one breaks, you use the other. And then ditto on the other side, you have them on both sides so that you can see the whole sky. So we ran our tests. And to my surprise, um, there was a major problem. Look here at lower right. This is the difference between my simple GPS and the spacecraft GPS. It has an amplitude of one millisecond, a period of 290 seconds, and, and it just oscillates. And this is a disaster. I mean, for the young pulsars, you screw up your times by millisecond, you barely see it. Right, you'd still see sharp crab pulses, you know, whales, crab, maybe not. Crab is 33 milliseconds, but we've got lots of pulsars with 200, 300, 500, 600 millisecond periods. Who cares? What's a millisecond between friends? And we didn't really believe in the millisecond pulsars at the time. Well, it turns out that it's half of our sample. It's a large amount of our science. And if the bug had still been there, we would have only seen a few consistent with expectations. And we would have seen broad sinusoidal peaks like people see for X-ray millisecond pulsars. So there's a good chance that everyone has said, OK, that's just what Mother Nature gave us. Uh, we fixed it, took a few months. And the bug, I understood right away, but there's massive bureaucracy. OK, so I need to speed up a little bit. Um, the point of this slide is that the references are here. If you want to read up documentation, on our ground time tests, here they are. And here at red says that we trust our timestamps to about 300 nanoseconds. And so my friendly advice for CTA is um, make a procedure for your Northern Telescope. See the crab optical pulsar with the least perturbation to your standard data acquisition. I mean, you'll have to change something probably, but as much as possible have standard data files, standard pipelines, standard processing, and, and have your optical pulsar come out with the right phase at the end. Now in the south, well, the crab is unique. Uh, the next brightest pulsar is a thousand times, a thousand times fainter. So it's a real challenge. But if there's an ambitious, smart grad student or postdoc listening today, do the calculation, figure out if, if, if a huge CTA mirror and delightful small pixels and exquisite fast electronics can let you do it. And I, I guarantee that if you succeed, um, pulsar people will notice, some people will notice. And otherwise, I wrote it here on the slide, dream something up. Okay, so we launched uh, 14 years ago next month. Everything worked right out of the box. We've got the cover of Science. And here's an advertisement for a paper that we just published in Science uh, in April, where it turns out that our timing is so good that we can actually contribute to the searches for gravitational waves. And we're just tickled pink about that. Um, I told you that the Pulsar to timing, timing Consortium has lived over 10 years beyond its normal expiration date. And this paper from 2019, we phase folded 1,000 gamma ray pulsars. That's these black dots and the colored dots for ones we see and new ones we discovered. The main thing in this paper is that we demonstrated that the five sigma threshold we've been using early in the mission is too conservative. Four sigma is fine. With four sigma, you are comfortably at the edge of your noise floor. And therefore, you can lower your threshold to four sigma if you are very careful about the number of trials you execute when you look for pulsations. And in this paper, we apply six trials, three for a weighting parameter, two for the choice of all of our data, or just when 
the ephemeris is formally valid. And in this way, you know what's going on. And this is a warning because trials are can, what can make your life miserable. You know, when you're starting out with your analyses, you're not quite sure what's the best this cut, the that cut. You know, we all know that um, reconstruction of Sharonkov imagers and stereo imagers is complicated and there's different recipes and you can be tempted to try recipe A, recipe D, and at the end of the day, if you start to see a three sigma signal in one of your samples and not in the others, your critics will correctly say, well, did you correct this for the 17 trials you made? So you need to understand the trials ahead of time. And so a lot of people come to me and say, Dave, you fuss so much about your ephemerides. Why don't you just download them from ATNF? And the answer is because they don't work. And the uh, time is running slight. So it's all here on the slide. My slides will be online for you. Um, so we're marching on. The rate of new pulsars seen in Fermi Lab is quickly approaching 300. We've detected 283. We have another 40 or so that we're pretty darn sure will become gamma ray pulsars in the next year or two. Ask me about it later if you care. Uh, yeah, the curve is starting to roll over a little bit, but we're still marching forward. All right. Let's talk about CTA. Let's talk about LAT first. So, as I said, Fermilat scans the whole sky eight times a day. During the seminar, we're getting more data on everything. And so, um, we potentially can see hundreds and hundreds of pulsars, even ones you don't expect. And so, we wanted, we needed hundreds of radio ephemerides. But it's worse than that. The lat is small, um, sort of a meter and a half by a meter and a half, and then, and then there's acceptance. So for our famous pulsars, we're not even getting one photon per month. And to see a signal above background, you integrate for years and years and years. And so we need our rotation ephemerides, our foldings to be valid. And the radio community, they, they said it couldn't be done, but we do it anyway. Well, actually, they said it had never been done, and it would be hard. The contrast is with CTA, where, as, as we said, um, you're going to have small numbers of pulsars. But better than that, better than that, um, you're, you, you, you look at a given pulsar during a season, springtime, here's this pulsar. Autumn, here's that pulsar. You'll look at it for three months, you'll look at it for five months. You're never gonna need a 10-year ephemeris, especially if you followed my advice and you're extremely careful and rigorous about the absolute alignment of your CTA pulses with respect to whatever instrument is providing your reference, because then you can look at it in spring of one year, spring of the next year, oops, rain and repairs the year after, three years later, more pulses, and if you're sure that every epoch you have the same alignment, then you can sum year after year and watch your signal grow. Okay, I hope and believe that Fermilat will fly forever. It's working great. And the funding committees are convinced that we should keep it working, but it could get hit by uh, an asteroid or something. <laughs> I hope not an asteroid, it could die. And so um, your plan B is to have timing from radio astronomers. And um, if, you, if you'd like, we, 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 uh, we in LAT who are doing this, a lot of us are radio astronomers and we're in good relations with them. So we can, we can help hook you up if you want to talk to them. Wow. It's now a quarter to, so 45, they asked me to say everything in 45 minutes. It's already 45 minutes and then 15 minutes for questions. We have still, yes, five to 10 minutes. Yeah, but we want time for questions. Okay, well, I'll get to the point. Um, what's a rotation ephemeris? Well, we already talked about this parabola here. Um, but it turns out that this F2 term, the thing that makes it bend, the quadratic term, 
it's really small. And if you're looking at short epochs, it's a straight line to a first approximation. The, I wanted to find phase. So you have a model for the frequency as a function of time. You integrate your model and you get the number of rotations as a function of time. And phase, phase is the remainder, the int integer remainder at a given time t. Um, don't confuse t0, which is the reference epoch for the spin down, with t0 mjd, which is one of three parameters in the ephemeris parameter files that help you get your absolute phase right. It's a convention. You need to understand the convention and respect it. Very centering. I'll be quick. Uh, you measure the time at your instrument, but your instrument is on the surface of the spinning Earth, which is going around the sun. And so you need to translate all those times to the solar system very center. The codes we use, I use Tempo 2. We'll talk about Pint later. They all do this. And I'm not going to explain to you about Jupiter and planetary ephemerides because I'm running out of time. F2 is what gives you the breaking rate index. It's a really interesting topic. We can talk about it some other day. But I do want to show you what a rotation ephemeris looks like in the real working world. And so I picked uh, one of the easiest ones we could get. This is a radio quiet pulsar found in a blind search by Colin Clark. And therefore it's gamma bright. And since it's gamma bright, mwah, gamma timing is easy. And um, it's a middle-aged pulsar. And so it's turbulence, youthful turbulence and trauma and all that has all gone away. And you see this ephemeris F0, F1. This is the, what you see here, this beautiful straight line. In f this is phase as a function of the years going by, is straight as an arrow with nothing but position, spin, and spin down rate. And it starts when our first data, this is August 4th, 2008, when our data became available. And this is 11.3 years later. So when there's no noise, um, ephemerides are very simple. I highly recommend anyone interested in pulsars to get in the habit of making this vertical plot all the time. Okay, so here I'm preaching about um, alignment again. Here I'm insisting on the fact that there's a validity for an ephemeris. We'll talk about that in a minute. And now let's move on to the more complicated cases. Well, I bet a lot of you, every time I say timing noise, you're thinking, oh, he must be talking about glitches. No, glitches and timing noise are related. Um, maybe there's a continuum connecting the two, but basically glitches are huge massive events where everything changes for a while, whereas glitches is just jitter all the time. And uh, glitches are just not that hard to deal with. You put a few parameters into your parameter file and we deal with it, or you block out that time. So glitches aren't, aren't a problem. Um, binary, binary is not a problem either. Uh, for most of your systems, the binary orbit is extremely stable. It's described with five lines in a parameter file, and then it works for years. This is what they use for gravitational waves. On the other hand, Fermi discovered large numbers of spiders. These are very tight systems where the companion star is pooping all over the neutron star and the wind, and it's just a mess. And so then uh, we whiten them to hell. Okay, so what I want to insist on here is um, what we have is a polynomial. And everybody listening today has fit noisy data to a polynomial. And we all know that as you increase the number of terms in your polynomial, you can get a better and better fit. But the more terms you have, the more A, no extrapolation is possible. And B, at some point, even interpolation starts to be problematic. So um, we do use very high order polynomials. The physical meaning of F0, F1, F2 that I talked about 
disappears. Um, it's now just the coefficients of a Taylor expansion. But uh, the code lets you go up to F13, F23, just you know, go as far as you want. When you start getting these very complicated noisy systems over long durations, rather than using a stupid polynomial, there are more clever things like harmonics of sinusoidals and a spline approach. And for the third pulsar catalog with our noisy pulsars, we have some horrific ephemerides. Um, but you people in CTA don't need to worry about that, at least not at first. Simple ephemerides are nice because you can calculate phases with a few lines of code. It's very attractive. And here I was just going to talk about how, if, never mind. Let's go on. So, um, how do you actually do it? Well, some words on software tools, what they do. As I said, I use Tempo 2. Uh, the way you make an ephemeris is you get a hold of radio TOAs, radio times of arrival, or X ray times of arrival. Friends of yours can send them to your colleagues. Or you make them from the LAT data, which is easy to do. There's good software. And then you put them into this tool, this graphic interface, and you click and you choose. And um, it works very nicely. It's, if you're going to do it, I recommend that you get help from someone who's done it. And then over here, um, what precision do we need on the ephemerides? That's a very important question. And we decided before launch that probably 20 milliperiods, a 50th of a revolution would work well. And on this plot, you can see plus 20, minus 20, thousandths of a rotation. And this is typical. What we find is that if you get to 20 milliperiods, it works. And there's no real point in trying to get better. But if you're substantially worse than that, you should probably figure out what's going on. Um, once you have an ephemeris to actually fold, with the lat data, it's incredibly easy. Um, all 14 years of lat data take 32 gigabytes on my laptop. Um, I use something from the science tools called GT Select to pick the ones within two degrees of the pulsar position. And then I run the Tempo 2 Fermi plugin written by my grad student a long time ago. Uh, it calls a Fermi data file and the F2 file, which gives you when, where exactly is the satellite in its orbit, and a parameter file. And it calculates the pulse phases and adds them to the FT1 file. And then you can make beautiful plots. And here's an example of a non-detection. Um, you see the pulse significance going up, weighted H test. It gets to 15, which apparently is a little under three sigma. And from the other slide I showed you, three sigma is a typical large fluctuation and is no reason to think that it's gamma pulsations. Here, furthermore, a sort of a sinusoidal profile, the first harmonic, yeah. Oh. To make TOAs from lat data, you extract peaks from short stretches of data and find the time using code in a package called geo time of arrival. First, you run I template to get your profile shape for this pulsar, gamma ray profile shape. And then you run something called U polyfold, and it just runs. It's very nice. Ah, but beware. You have to have very centered the time first, and I do that using a science tool. It works great. It's written up in the app J. And in Fermilab, we have the FSSC, Fermi Science Support Center. And there's a whole page full of wonderful software tools. This is where you can get GeoTOA. It's nicely written up. Um, you need to use weights for that data. They're nicely written up um, by Philippe Ruel. And there's the link. And what you get in this add weights is um, it's, 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 it's a 10 line Python script that you call from your code and it's just, it's just easy. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, I'm an old fart, so I like Tempo 2. But you youngsters, and I use the science tools, I don't like them, but it's just what I use. 
Fermi Pi for young people, Fermi Pi for beginners, and Pint. Pint is the future. And so then I asked Paul Ray and Matthew Kerr, I said, um, can I tell these people at CTA that, that, that this tool does what I said it does? And Pint says, yeah, yeah, it's definitely good for building your ephemeris from the TOAs. Um, and it's definitely good for folding Fermi data. And it's definitely good for folding TV data. You've got, they're all in there. He says, um, it doesn't make TOAs yet, but if there's enough, he uses something from NICER, which is also available. But he says, if the CTA people want it, we can add it to Pint. And then Matthew, Matthew chipped in his two bits about how he uses Pint. Okay, last slide. Conclusions. Um, Y'all are gonna do beautiful stuff. I'm looking forward to it. You don't have the radical needs for timing, radio timing that we did. You can just use what we have done to get what you need with some radio input here and there. You'll, you'll wanna overlay a radio profile from time to time. You want it to be up to date. You wanna do a sanity check. But, so you will need some radio input, but you won't need a massive campaign with an MOU with 50 people, 20 people, and 10 observatories. And then um, I'm saying this to young people, postdocs, grad students, once again, use your imagination to think about what can go wrong. Use your imagination to invent tests, to check if it works, because anything that hasn't been tested well probably doesn't work. Thank you very much. <laughs>